Happy Sabbath. So we want to present to you uh, the finality of the gospel, like the end game. I don't know if anybody here has been watched Marvel movies, but it took them the better part of a decade <clears throat> to get to to uh, that last movie, right? Endgame, the Avengers, Endgame. If anybody know about the Marvel Universe, they, they, laid out, they laid out a whole narrative and a whole world building program and a whole universe that by the end of it, when you actually saw whatever the last movie was, uh, yeah, it was Endgame, you were like, it all came to, uh, to a huge climax. Uh, you know, the, the gospel presents a huge climax. And uh, it's rather surprising the climax it presents. I think that oftentimes I, we think that the climax is uh, the second coming. And uh, no, it's, that's just the end of this story. But the, the mountaintop is really something else. <laughs> and so if you permit me for the next eh, maybe 35 minutes, we're just going to take a, a dive into how Scripture presents this. Is this all right? Yeah, is that okay if we do it? You got some Bibles out? Yeah? I'm going to begin with a question, and I want you to answer for me. You ready? Okay? You ready? You know that at church we can talk back and forth, right? Right? Like, we can talk back and forth. Here's, here's the question. Who is the Son of God? Say, say it like you mean it. Who is the Son of God? Jesus. Jesus, one more time. Who is the Son of God? Jesus. Good, good. Now, I want you to turn with me to Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3, so I want you to see what the good Dr. Luke actually says about who is the Son of God. You ready? This is going to be a surprise. Ready? Luke chapter 3, and you know that in Luke chapter 3, there's a genealogy. A genealogy is like a family tree. It's a family history that breaks down the whole lineage of a family. And in Luke chapter 3, uh, Luke does a genealogy of Jesus beginning in verse 23, right? If we go down to, say, verse 36, Luke 3, 36, we're going to begin the uh, concluding Luke's genealogy, his history of Jesus, his family tree of Jesus. And if you see Luke chapter 3, verse 36, and if you're in our Bibles, it's on page 501, it says, this is the genealogy, right? This genealogy began with Jesus. When he began his ministry, he was about 30 years old and was the son, as it was supposed, of Joseph. And then it follows, follows, follows. Look at verse 36. He was the son of Canaan the son of Arphaxad, the son of Shem, the son of Noah, the son of Lamech, the son of Methuselah. We're getting to some familiar names, yeah? The son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahalaleel. How's that one for you? Mahalaleel. The son of Canaan. You ready for it? The son of Enos, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of so according to Luke chapter 3, the good doctor, when he does his genealogy, goes all the way back to the beginning, and what does he call Adam? A son of what? The son of God, Adam. What does that mean? What, is, what does that mean? Do I have your attention, Brother Eric? Do you know that Jesus is not the only son of God in Scripture? Adam, the son of God. Do you know that there are other sons of God than just Adam and Jesus? If you turn with me to Job, chapter 1. You turn to Job, chapter 1. And all of a sudden, the text explodes with different sons of God. You go to Job chapter 1, verse 6. Job chapter 1, verse 6. Job chapter 1, verse 6. Look at this. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. What is this? Yet again, a reference to sons of God that I don't think are Adam, and are not Jesus. So these sons of God show up and they present themselves before the Lord. And who's amongst them? 
Satan is amongst them. Very interesting, yeah? Now, we're told, verse 7, the Lord said to Satan, from where have you come from? And Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down it, in it. What, what, is, what is going on here? You look at Job chapter 2, verse 1. Job chapter 2, verse 1. Just a little bit down from the page for me, right? Job chapter 2, verse 1. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came among them to present himself before the Lord. So these sons of God show up, and Satan is among them, yeah? Fascinating thing. So, so far, you told me Jesus was the son of God. I showed you in Luke 3 that Luke thinks that Adam is the son of God, but in Job, there's this other group who are these sons of God. What is going on? Well, let me tell you a little something about these sons of God. These sons of God certainly exist before earth emerges, before earth is created, these sons of God exist. Did you know that? If you turn with me to Job, stay in the same book. Turn with me to Job 38. Job 38, we're going to be reading from verse 4. Job 38, verse 4. Now, if you know anything about the book of Job, you guys remember how the book of Job goes? Job is a really rich guy, has a lot of wealth, he has children. And what happens to all his wealth and his children? It all disappears. It all goes, yeah? Job goes from wealthy to destitute, and the book of Job is him surrounded by these friends of his who begin to inquire as to what he must have done for God to, like, do this to him. And Job was like, I'm, what are y'all talking about? Like, I, I'm blameless. Like, I, I didn't do anything, Right? And this is kind of the arc of the story of Job. And at some point in the book of Job, Job begins to inquire for himself, like, why is this going on? I want to talk to God about this. So the book of Job is, at one point, Job shifts and he's like, I need to talk to God about this. I want to actually interview him. I want to ask him questions. Why God? Why God? Why God? Can anybody uh, relate with that question? Anybody relate? Be, be, you know, but be careful about that. Why? Because, man, if you see how Job, look at Job 38, verse 4. Look how God responds. God comes down and doesn't let Job ask him questions. He asks Job questions. He's like, oh, you want to know why? why? Oh, well, let me ask you a few questions, Job. Look what he says. He's like, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? You want to know the mysteries of why things happen the way they happen? Let me know if you're capable of understanding the mysteries of why things happen the way they happen. When I made the earth, where were you? What does Job have to say? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely, Job, you must know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? You see, God's talking creation here. Now look at this. When the morning stars sang together and the sons of God did what? So Job, where were you when I was making the earth and the morning stars, angels, and these sons of God actually saw me doing what I was doing, flinging the stars in the sky, and the sons of God shouted like, yay, wow, 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 where were you? You weren't around. You see what's going on here? But who was? These sons of God were around. The angels were around. So Jesus as the son of God, Adam as the son of God, in this grouping that are the sons of God, B'nai Elohim in the Hebrew, these sons of God, they actually exist in some meaningful way prior to the emergence of earth. Because when one man from earth, Job, is actually inquiring to talk to God, God presents to him this whole panoramic view of him actually creating and the human not being there, but the sons of God were actually present, cheering God along. Fascinating, yeah? Do you know that Adam, as a son of God, he's given dominion? Do you know what I mean by dominion? He's given a territory that he's responsible for. And what territory is he given that he's responsible for? earth, right? So Adam as the son of God 
is given a dominion that he's responsible for. Are we good so far? Now, what happens to Adam's dominion? Does he retain his dominion? There's a little story. I don't know if you've heard it. It's at the beginning of the book. There's a tree, and there's a serpent, and then there's this whole exchange with the husband and the wife and fruit. And what we're told is that Adam is actually kicked out of the center of authority, Eden. He's kicked out of that place where he had dominion. He's exiled, and the earth is no longer in cooperation with him. Have y'all, have y'all read this story? Do you know it? Jesus, several thousand years later, shows up, and he's in a wilderness. And he spends 40 days in a wilderness, and after spending 40 days in the wilderness, he's rather hungry. Go with me to Luke chapter 4. He's rather hungry, and, and, and he says something very, very fascinating in Luke chapter 4. If you turn there with me, Luke chapter 4. And you look on uh, verse 3. Luke chapter 4, first, for, uh, Luke chapter 4 verse 3. Now remember, Adam as the son of God had dominion. He loses that dominion because of his disobedience. But where does that dominion get transferred to? Look what Luke says. Back to Luke. Same place we started. Look. The devil said to him, this is the devil talking to Jesus after his 40 days. He says, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become bread. Go, wait, don't, don't turn. Go back with me. Do you see what he's questioning? He's questioning his identity as what? Now, if you follow me, that it seems to be that Adam as the son of God had dominion. If there is another son of God that comes into the world, if, if we look at son of God as kind of like a title, as some sort of category, because there's more than just one. If you look at Son of God as a category, and we say that whatever sons of God are, they're given dominion. Adam, as a son of God, had dominion over earth. Whatever a son of God is, is given dominion. If Satan or the devil sees someone that might fit that category of son of God, what is the natural question? Well, what is your dominion? Are y'all tracking with me? If a being comes into the world that might fit the category of the Son of God, what might be the worry on the part of the enemy? That the dominion that he holds might be threatened if another Son of God comes in to compete. Are you following with me? Watch, look. If you're the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. Watch the logic of what follows. Verse 4. And Jesus answered, as it's written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Keep going, Ed. Right, look at it. And the devil took him and showed him all the what? All the what? Do you know what those are? You know what another name for kingdoms are? Dominions. Showed him all the kingdoms of the world and more. Look what he says, verse 6. And said to him, to you I will give this authority and the glory, for it has been what? Delivered to, and I give to whom I So the dominion is under the charge of whom? And he's wanting to see whether or not the one that's arriving is the one that's going to threaten his dominion. So if you go with me all the way back to Job, chapter 2, Job chapter 2, and you see that the sons of God actually show up. Who are these sons of God? Biblical scholars and others have noted that these sons of God are no, none other than some sort of being that exists in the supernatural realm, right? In the realm beyond ours, that actually has some sort of meaningful dominion over territory that belongs to God. Let me say this again. These sons of God are beings that exist in the supernatural realm that have some sort of dominion over territory 
that belongs to God, that is not limited to this territory. Are y'all picking up what's being laid down? So that when the sons of God actually meet in Job chapter 1, what is this meeting? It's actually a meeting of the board. It's these sons of God coming to report how things are going in their territory. These board meetings probably were very, very straight to the point for a long time. How's it going? It's all good. You, all good. You, all good. You, all good. God looks, he sees, yeah, it's all good. All right, see you guys next week. All right. But at some point, when all the sons of God came together, Job tells us that there's another one that comes with them. And who comes with them? The accuser, the enemy. Now we know because Luke tells us that the accuser has a claim, a legal right, on the world because the dominion has been given over to him. And how did he get the dominion? Well, Adam, the son of God, lost it when he fell in disobedience so that the actual legal right of the world was handed to the general of the rebellion, whom we know as the accuser, the enemy, the dragon of old. And when Jesus actually shows up and is tempted in the wilderness, and the enemy, the dragon of old, the accuser, the devil, actually makes a claim and says, this has all been given to me. Notice that Jesus does not correct him as though he's telling a lie. Fascinatingly enough, Paul actually calls the devil the god of this world. He calls him the prince of the power of the air. And it's an absolute agreement with what Job tells us, that when this council actually gets together to discuss the goings-ons of the universe, there was one who shows up with a legal right to be there because he has dominion over a territory that was yielded over to him. You with me? So at some point in Earth's history, whenever this council gets together, you know who your representative was? How's about that? So God convenes a meeting of his celestial board, and they all gather in front. And guess who shows up to represent Earth? Our little friend. And the question is, where are you coming from? From Earth, walking back and forth. That's my territory. That's a terrible situation, is it not? <laughs> I mean, for us. Don't you think so? That's, that's, that's what we would call no bueno. No bueno. No bueno. We would think that this, this situation would have to be corrected, yeah? And we're told that the situation is corrected. We're told that God looked at the situation. And if you turn with me to Philippians 2, we're told what happens. God looked at the situation. And in Philippians 2, this situation cannot be upheld. It can't continue. Look at verse 5. Jesus looks at the situation and says, mm-mm, mm-mm, mm-mm. My sons and daughters don't get to be ruled by a pretender. My sons and daughters will not forever remain under the dominion of a false god. My sons and daughters do not get to live forever under, under the deception of a false father, as though he's the true father. He's not. This can't continue forever. They've been kidnapped. They've been deceived. They've been sequestered. And I will not endure this. All these other planets and all these other dominions, you guys will be fine. But I'm going down for the one. I'll leave the 99. You tracking with me? And look what it tells us. Have this mind amongst yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the very form of God, did not, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, 
But what? But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Why was Jesus born in the likeness of men? Because we were under the dominion of sin. We were condemned to death. Why? Because death came through sin, and since all have sinned, all are given over to and for us to actually be redeemed, what needed to be solved? What needed to be solved is that the power of death needed to be broken. But condemnation, condemnation, the condemnation that was proper to Adam needed to be executed. Because the law doesn't change, yeah? Talked about that all this week. The law remains. So the very law that condemns must be executed. And as we've seen all week, if you've been following, which I'm sure that you have, there's a reality in Scripture about Adam number one and the second Adam, Adam number two. This Adam, he's the one that lost the world. That's the Adam that lost the world. This Adam, this is the Adam that regains. But how does this Adam regain what this Adam lost? If this Adam has to absolutely suffer the condemnation of death. Let me point out something to you. Have you ever noticed that after the pair in Eden, Adam and Eve, after they both eat the fruit and God comes down and does his investigation, have you ever noticed what the curses that fall on the different actors in that story are? Have you ever noticed? Have you ever noticed that it exists in the body? For instance, the serpent. What happens to the serpent? Right? If we hold that the, serp the serpent was some sort of beautiful being that had many colors, and there's a lot of evidence as to why we would believe that, right? There's a good number of reasons why we would believe that. If, if the serpent was a beautiful being, had many colors, that's why Eve, to some degree, was attracted to it. This is sort of the narrative. What happens to the serpent? Does, it, does its body actually change? Yeah. It goes from beautiful trees, colorful, to belly ground dust. Yeah? So where does the serpent actually receive the curse? In the? In the? In the? The woman, for instance. The woman, what, what happens to the woman? She, she actually experiences quite the transformation now because for her to actually bring children into the world, she has to be on the cusp of death in the most intense pain. You know, sometimes we don't appreciate this because of modern medicine, but prior to modern medicine, every time a woman has a child, she has one foot in the grave. That's why every single child that's born into this world seemingly, symbolically, is coming out of the clutches of death. Right? Go to the third world, and it's a whole different story. Right? A pregnant woman giving birth is not just, oh, yeah, she went to the hospital today. We're going to see the baby. No, it's worrisome and troublesome because we're not quite certain if mom is going to make it. So does the woman suffer some meaningful change in her body? So the serpent, body. The woman, body. Have you ever seen what the man gets? And do you know what's cursed? It's not the man that's cursed. What's cursed? The ground. So the serpent body, the woman body, the man who has dominion, Adam, the leader of the race, they're like, yeah, the ground. <laughs> what? Doesn't sound fair now, does it? Do you know why? Because do you know the only curse that's proper to him? Do you know what the only curse that's appropriate for him? And if the curse had been executed on him, we wouldn't be here. He to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood. Do you know he interposes his life immediately right away? 
Do you know that the promise of the lamb is immediate from that moment where Adam loses dominion? Immediately. Why? So that the curse that is proper to the man with dominion doesn't actually fall on him. And what does he do? Oh, what does he do? What does he do? Well, what we're told in Philippians 2 is that he gets out of his throne and is born into the likeness of a man, but not just any man, a servant, but not just any service. It's a service in where he's obedient unto, obedient unto, obedient unto. Why? 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 Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. I wish, I wish I had time to break this all down. I don't. But Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1, Ed. For y'all that have been with us this week, this is why the law can't give you life. This is why the law is never enough. For the law has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities. It can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every day, make perfect those who draw near. This is talking about the sanctuary service. And when you come to the sanctuary service, can you actually be made perfect? Can you be made righteous according to what you offer? No. And do you know what's inside of the holy of holies inside of the ark? The Ten Commandments that actually demonstrate the righteousness of God. Can you ever actually become that righteousness by participating in the law service and looking at the law? No. It can't give you life. It can't make you righteous. By the same sacrifice that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Verse 2. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sin? If this system actually worked, if you can actually behave your way to righteousness, if God was just giving you power to be better today than you were yesterday so that you can actually meet requirements, then would you not have arrived at some sort of perfection if that system could actually work? Because if you aren't arriving at that perfection, then the perfection, the problem might be the system. But that system was never intended to make you perfect. Why? Because you were under condemnation of death. Adam's problem is not that he is morally bankrupt. And then that Christianity is a message to make you behave better. Adam's problem is that he is now determined to death. Adam is determined to death. Adam is determined to death, and there is no hope for him unless the execution of death actually happens. He can't behave his way out of this predicament. You can give him the law all you want. He can keep the law as perfectly as he could for the rest of his 950 years and only have broken that one time, and he's still conditioned to... It ain't about behavior. It's about our imprisonment through sin unto... We are born into this world, and the moment we come out and we take our first breath, that is a law, the first step on that long journey to the grave. There's no child that has emerged from this here world that doesn't have a trajectory straight to the grave. Because our condition is one that is under the condemnation of, we need rescue from death. And this stuff gets really real. Like it's, we, we can do all the theology in the world. And we could do this every seven days, yeah? And it's all good. And I love it. But you know when it gets really real? When you get that phone call and you're told that so-and-so died. All of a sudden, all that theology takes a back seat to one hope and one hope only. Whether or not death has been overcome. I just got one of those phone calls this week. One of my close buddies that I spent five years as his absolute neighbor. He was my landlord. We were really close. Good buddy of mine. Early 40s. Leaves behind an 11-year-old and an 8-year-old. You know what doesn't really matter in that moment when you get that phone call? How we understand Galatians. 
You know what doesn't really matter primarily right there in that phone call? Who the Roman 7 person is. You know what matters in that phone call? Does death have the final word? Does death have the final word? And if we remain under the governance of the false father, then that's our lot in life. If that usurper and that false son of God stays representing us, then that is the final word. But he to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood. Look what it says, verse 3. But in these sacrifices, there are a reminder of sins every year. Do you know why there's a reminder of sins? It's not to point out to you that you're morally bankrupt. It's not constantly like, oh, you need to behave better. You need to behave better. The reason there's a reminder of sins every year is so that you know you're still in the clutches of death. That's the point of the sanctuary system. The sanctuary system is supposed to imprint on your mind that you're in a cycle of life and death. It's a mortality cycle that you need redemption from. That's the point of the sanctuary. You need to be redeemed and saved from death by being released from sin. We, we, took, we, we took the sanctuary and we made it a system of behavior modification. I confess, I get a little grace, forgiveness to empower me to live ethically. That's not what the sanctuary is about. The sanctuary is about the revelation of God's goodness by giving his own son so that he might actually bring us into intimacy with him. The Lamb of God that is offered is at the altar so that you and I could have access into life. That's what the sanctuary is about. The Lamb of God is on the altar, goes through the baptism of water so that you and I can die with him resurrect with him so that we can have life and intimacy with our Father in the most holy place. That's what the sanctuary is about. From death at the altar to life in the most holy place without avail because we've been resurrected and we can run boldly to the throne because we are now children. That's the sanctuary. And do you know what the sanctuary is about? It's not about you praying through it to get a little touch of grace to behave better. The sanctuary is the revelation of Jesus Christ because Jesus is revealed in the sanctuary and the sanctuary is a revelation of Jesus. Are y'all tracking with me? Have you read the book of Revelation lately? It's a revelation of him. And look what Jesus understands about the sanctuary. Verse 4. It's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. That system can't take away sin. So verse 5, consequently, look at this, grasp this. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, what does it say? So think about this, y'all. If y'all understand what, this is Jesus at 12 years old. Jesus is 12 years old, and he's in Jerusalem. You remember the story? He's in Jerusalem. And he's gone for how many days? He's lost from Joseph and Mary. You guys remember this story? And where is he those three days? With the priests. Where? In the temple. Sanctuary. And what is it that he's actually, what's coming to his mind finally? He's watching the story and it's clicking. And what's clicking? Oh, this isn't the place where people come to get some moral, ethical sort of transformation. This whole story is about, this whole thing is about how I'm going to come and die. This whole story is about how I'm going to be baptized in the baptism of death. This is a story about how I am going to become a faithful high priest. This is a story about how I am going to rip the veil and free them who are under a false father so that they can have intimacy with my father, their father. And that's why I'm not ashamed to call them brothers because those who are enslaved have the same source of salvation that I do, our God and father, the only legitimate king of the world. So Jesus is watching this, and what is he realizing? That the sanctuary tells the story of, and what does he say? Consequently, Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired. So the way the system is, that's not the point. It's teaching us something. And what is it teaching us? But a, but a, but a, the serpent receives the curse in the, 
The woman receives the curse in the? He who knew no sin was made to be sin so that he might receive the curse in the body, resurrect so that he can give us a new body and therefore fulfill the promise of giving us life. Are you tracking with me? This is why it's so important to understand that Adam too has a new body because he's absolutely secured the reality that he promised us when he interposed his precious blood even here. He said, I will deliver you from the condemnation. I will bring you to myself and I will deliver you through death. Rise victorious. And since I'm alive, so are you. Because as I am, so are you. Because I am your real father. I am the revelation of he who loves you. I am the real son of God. I am the one that has authority. I am the one that should be standing there. And, that, and I am. And if I am, so are you with me. There's a great story that tells us about this in the book of Kings. I think it's 2 Kings 17. I'll just rehearse it for you because you know it well. It's the story of two women, and they both have infants. You know this story? These two women have infants, and they're women of questionable employment. But they're roommates, and they both have infant babies. And as they're sleeping one night, one of the women, one of the women rolls over on her baby and suffocates the child. Do you know this story? In the middle of the night, she realizes what she's done. She takes the living child from her roommate, switches, does the old switcheroo, takes the living child, puts the dead child next to her roommate in hopes that nobody's the wiser. They wake up in the morning, and the second woman sees that this child is dead next to her, and she I'm sure it would let out a gasp, like, oh. But then upon closer inspection, she realizes this is not actually her child. You've heard this story? And then she enters a quarrel with her roommate, like, that's not, this isn't my child, this is your child. You did this. Give me back my child. But what does the first woman say? Absolutely not. This is my child. My child is the living one. And what happens? They enter into a quarrel as to who is the proper parent of the living child. It goes all the way up to the executive court of Solomon, yeah? And Solomon, we're told, is the wisest king who's ever lived, yeah? One of the wisest men who ever lived in. And I could imagine that when this issue is raised before the court, I could imagine there's an audience much like this one, and they're probably thinking to themselves like, oh man, Solomon, he's gonna figure this one out. He's a smart one. You could imagine maybe somebody's their first day on the job. Hey man, Solomon's the wisest king. He's gonna figure this out. Watch, listen, this is gonna be good. These two mothers, clarity's gonna come. Solomon hears the story and considers, and then what does Solomon respond? He's like, get me a sword. Let's chop him in half. <laughs> this guy probably thinks, oh, no, 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 he's having a bad day. That's not a good idea at all. That's not, that's not, that's it. He must have, he, yeah, he, no, 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 you know, everybody has a bad day. <laughs> but Solomon knows something. What is it that Solomon knows? Say it out loud. Say it one more time. Solomon knows about the love of a parent. And he brings that sword. And as he says that that sword is about to fall, what does the real parent do? She shrieks and she says, no. Let my enemy have the child, but let the child live. No. Let my enemy have the child, but let the child live. Could you imagine, imagine in that story if the child had actually gone with the enemy. Could you imagine the way that child would have been brought up? That child would have been brought up by the enemy and the child's real parent would be watching this child being raised by the false parent. And what do you think the false parent would tell the child about the other parent? They're going to tell you they're their parent, but they're not really your parent. They don't love you like they say they do. What they really are is like some harsh, severe, exacting creditor who's looking to visit you with punishments. Don't believe or trust them. That's what it would be like to be raised by the false parent, wouldn't it? And so that the child would be all confused. Putting their heart in allegiance with the false parent 
all the while actually being related to the real parent and not knowing. Sons and daughters giving their allegiance to a false parent and thinking that they're related to that false parent when in truth they're related to another. I'm no better than my sinfulness. Who told you that? I need to come and grovel to God to receive forgiveness. Who told you that? I can never be free from sin because of my experience. Who told you that? I can't just live free and be alive in the spirit. I'm sometimes in the flesh. Who told you that? He comes to tell us the truth. And what does he tell us? He tells us that there is absolutely nothing on heaven or below, present nor future, angels or demons, that can separate you from the love of your true parent. And in order for you to know this, he will actually take the condemnation that belonged to Adam. He will become sinful flesh. He will become sin itself in order to condemn sin and take it to death so that you might be liberated from the tyranny of your enslavement. Go to John 12. Look at John 12. Look at what John 12 says. I'm looking at John 12, verse 30. 31. Look at John 12, verse 31 on page 524. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the what? Will the ruler of this world be cast out? The one who stood in that spot of representation, now will he be cast out? How? Verse 32. When I am lifted up from the earth, I will do what? Draw all. The revelation of the true Father will burst forth, and I will draw all lost sons and daughters to me. When the message of the Father's love through my sacrifice that I become sin, I take the curse for their sake, so that they might receive the promise of Abraham, the promised Holy Spirit, so that they might be empowered to live according to the Spirit that they were created through, not the flesh that they fell into. When I am elevated, I will draw them all back to me. Verse 33. And he said this to show what kind of death he was going to die. Now, who wrote the book of Revelation? Who wrote the book of John? Who wrote the book of John? Who wrote the book of Revelation? It ain't a trick question. I can see that you're kind of hesitant after, after a week of like me pulling switcheroos. You're like, it's Stockholm Syndrome. I get it. <laughs> Revelation 12. I want you to keep a finger in John, but go to Revelation 12. Look at Revelation 12 and verse 10 and see if it agrees with anything. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. Now the authority of the true Son of God has emerged. Now the salvation and the power of the true Father in the true power of the kingdom and the authority of the true Christ has come. When? At the cross, when the manifestation of the Father's love through Jesus becoming sin and taking sin to death so that you and I could have life was demonstrated. It was there that the authority shifted yet again. And what was lost now became redeemed through Jesus Christ. And when he resurrected, he had all authority given to him so that he might now be our representative. So that where sin abounded, grace now abounds that much more. When Jesus burst forth as the second Adam, victorious, clean, free, he resurrects you and I with him in his body, in his person. He is the saved human. 
while at the same time being the saving God. This is the mystery of the incarnation. He is the saving God and the saved human in his person. He is the choosing God and the chosen man. Not because he was created, but because he incarnated himself and attached himself with humanity through bonds that can never be broken. Are y'all tracking with what I'm saying? Not because he was created, but because he attached himself to humanity in a way that can never be broken. So that now when he burst forth, guess who stands for us? You know that when he was on the cross, he was getting ripped apart. Ripped apart. And did he step off the cross in that moment because it was too much? Did he live through his feelings in that moment and his emotions? No, what did he do? He entrusted himself to his father who was faithful. And for the love that he had for you and I, lost sons and daughters, he endured. So that he can burst forth in glorious day on that resurrection morning, having completed the victory that was necessary for us to be delivered from Adam 2 and be trans from Adam 1 and be transferred into Adam 2. You know, Psalm 24 gives us a prophetic vision of what happens when Jesus is resurrected. Have you ever considered Psalm 24? You go to Psalm 24, and it's a prophetic, it's a prophetic insight. We start with verse 3. Think about the sons of God that were there when the world was created, how we talked about back at the beginning. Now there's a whole different sort of joy in heaven, not because of creation, but because of redemption. And the question is asked. This is the question. Remember, in Philippians chapter 2, Jesus leaves his seat, comes down to earth, yeah? That seat's been empty for a little while, at least 33 years. And that seat is at the top of the mountain of the north on holy Zion. And the question now becomes, who can ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? Look what the answer is, verse 4. He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. That's him. Now notice the question that is asked. Verse 7, you go to verse 7. Jesus is resurrected. He's passed through the heavens. You imagine him just ascending, piercing through the atmosphere and traversing space and time, however way that work, way works. And he lands in the celestial city. And there are sentinels on the gates. And they're asking, who will actually ascend on the holy hill? And Jesus, now victorious, choosing God, chosen man, saving God, saved man. The new son of God, he emerges. And it said, lift up your gates. Lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory might come in. He's ascending. He's manifesting in full victory. Open up the gates. He's home. Open up the gates. He is victorious. Verse 8. Who is the king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Who has overcome death and redeemed the lost. Brought him back home to the true father. Open up the gates. Verse 9, lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory might come in. Question is asked, who is the king of glory? The Lord of hosts is the king of glory. Jesus, Adam 2, the righteous one. Is that not exciting? Does that not stir your heart? That's pretty good gospel, right? But what if I told you that's not the gospel? Because it can't just be there. See, Jesus comes through the gates. And you know where the council would usually meet? There's a spot that used to belong to Adam, that Adam lost, and that the enemy stood in for a while. But now that spot has nobody in it. Because the enemy has lost his rightful rule. He can no longer be part of the council of the sons of God. Because earth now has a new representative. And you can imagine Jesus taking his place. Where the first Adam once stood, now the second Adam stands and reigns. 
so that where sin abounded, grace now abounds all the more. And where we were once represented by an enemy, we are now under the truth of the God who has loved us. Is that not good gospel? Pretty good gospel? Still not the full gospel. Because Jesus doesn't stay standing there. Jesus don't stand. He might have a moment of sentimentality. Remember that first Adam that he will see again because he's the God of the living, but he keeps moving. He doesn't stand with the council. He now takes his place on the seat that he left and sits back down as the returning king of glory. And he unites humanity in himself right there on that throne so that you and I could now know that our representative doesn't just simply stand before the throne like it was with Adam. Now our representative is the king who sits on the throne so that where sin abounded, grace abounds that much more. And that's why our standing now in Christ is different than what it could have ever been in Adam. Isn't that good gospel? Still not the full gospel. Because there's, oh, but a little bit more. This would be the nice part where if I were a good evangelist, I would say, if this is such a good gospel, wouldn't you open up your heart and let him in? Right? Maybe I'd take you to the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 20. And I would say, behold, he stands at the door and he, won't you open up the door of your heart? See, but... I don't really fancy myself an evangelist. I just fancy myself a brother among sons and daughters. I just want to spark you into revival by telling you that the end game isn't Revelation 20. I challenge you to go to Revelation 3, verse 21. Go to Revelation 3, verse 21. To him who conquers... I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Did you know that the end game of the gospel is not for us to merely have a representative on the throne, but for you and I to be co-heirs seated with him on the throne? Because God's the sort of God that takes the low of the low and puts him in the high of the high simply because he wants to. And that your destiny has always been to be heirs of the universe through Christ who has redeemed you from your false father. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. Listen to this. Ephesians chapter 2. And just read this with me. Consider this. And you, you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit of that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. That was, you used to be that. Verse three, among whom you all once lived in the passions of your flesh. When you were alive in Adam one and alive to the passions of your flesh, you used to be this. And you carried out the desires of the body and mind. We talked about this all week. In Adam one, you carried these things out and you were by nature children of wrath. Why? Because according to the order that you were born into, you were destined for death like the rest of mankind, but God, but God, because you behave so well, but God, because you kept the law, but God, because you finally got smart and asked him for forgiveness. Stop being so self-centered. It's not about you. It's for you. But God, rich in mercy, because of the great love which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, even when we were murdering him, even when we didn't have an understanding 
of how great our inheritance could be, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. When did he make us alive? When we were dead. By grace, you've been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Are you seeing this? I didn't make this up. He seated you in heavenly places because your life is hid in Christ with God. Verse 7, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Verse 8, for by the grace, for by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is a gift of God. Receive this gift. That's it. It's a gift that's received. And when you receive it, you live it out. You walk it out because you know it's yours. I don't know why we want to so desperately keep this gift distant from us and think we only get a little bit at a time as we make progress. How dare we shortchange the love of God who has given himself liberally for us and, 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 and put his love in jeopardy because we have a theological system to hold on to. Stop. Stop. Just receive the grace of God that calls you beloved and has actually given you the power to live righteously. Not because you do something, but because you are something, because he loves you. He sees sons and daughters. That's it. There is no other reason for God to do what he has done other than the fact that he loves you. Verse 9. This isn't a result of works. It ain't because of something that we did so that anybody could boast. Verse 10, for we are his workmanship. What does that mean? We are created, new creation in Christ Jesus, created in Jesus unto good works. Do you know why we live in good works? Do you know why we live righteously? Because we're already made new in Jesus. Think about that. We put the cart before the horse. It's not due in order to be. It's due because you already are. You have the privilege of living a life because you are the redeemed. You are the saints. You are the light of the world. You are seated in heavenly places. You are resurrected. There's going to come a day. Go to Ephesians 2, verse 6. Look at this. There's going to come a day. Verse 6. Raised us up and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Why? Verse 7. So that in the coming ages he might show immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Do you know that you exist as the evidence of God's goodness for the rest of the universe for all time? You yourselves exist as the evidence of God's goodness to the rest of the universe for all time. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Do you know why sin will never arise ever again? Because he's going to have a people that will tell the story of his goodness to those who don't know. And do you know who that is? Why don't we start telling that story now? Because we believe that story now. You know that this house can be filled with people that have heard our story of how we have received victory because he's loved us well. Instead of people coming every week to get something that they don't believe they have so that they can make it through the week. It's going to go like this, beloved. A million, when we've been there 10,000 years, and earth has actually now become the center of the universe, because you know heaven is in our home, earth is. We'll be up there for a little while, but it'll all come back. We're, we're here, back on earth, 10,000 years from now. Maybe God gets up to his old tricks and starts creating yet again, yeah? Wouldn't that be awesome to be like the sons of God, to see him create? And maybe we can now celebrate all together. Maybe even Job might be amongst us at that point. Look at him go, doing it again. Stars into existence, speaking planets to life. And whatever new creation that he makes, they pop up. And I don't know, maybe, maybe in the new world there's going to be some sort of universal just tourist program. People just 
go different places, check out different earths, different dominions that they're not a part of. And maybe one day those new creation, one of them shows up to earth, shows up to the holy hill of Zion that's now on earth and goes by the throne, looks at the throne, And it's curious, what's going on over there? And this new creation sees an angel flying by and stops the angels. Hey, hey, angel, angel, come here. Angel descends, like, yeah, yeah, well, what can I help you? I had a question. He's like, oh, you're one of the new creation, aren't you? Yeah, 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 yeah. He's like, well, welcome to reality. Like, Thank you. Uh, uh, listen, I got a question for you, angel. Yeah, what's that? He's like, look on the throne. He's like, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. The angel kind of, yeah. Angel, why is there a man sitting on the throne of God? And the angel looked at him and said, oh, <laughs> you don't know. He's like, know what? He's like, you don't know the story. What story? That's where the angel will fall silent because it won't be his story to tell. And a call will go out and the angel might call out, Rachel! Rachel, I need you to come and tell the story. Bring Greg and Julia with you. And maybe I don't know where you guys are at. You're hanging out and you, Eric, Eric, you need to come with us. And of course, Eric's going to call out to Bethany. Bethany, come on. Come on. Bethany's out somewhere. We got to call Eddie. Eddie! Eddie! And for some reason, Eddie's praying over somebody somewhere. Eddie calls out to Rick. Rick calls out to Justin. And all of us descend right there where that new creation is. And we begin to tell the story that only we can tell about how we were once condemned to death and how we were once under the authority of a false father. But that the great God of heaven loved us so that he gave himself to us and became one of us so that he could deliver us from death. And that forevermore, he will be a man so that we could have standing. So that those who were lost could live found. And that those who were last could be first. Because where sin abounded, his love abounds that much more. He would not leave us under the condition of Adam 1, but he transferred us into Adam 2. He wouldn't leave us under the condemnation of the law, but he empowers us through grace. He wouldn't leave us decaying in the flesh, but he gave us a life in the spirit. And we have it now. We have it, and it's yours. This is the goal of the gospel. This is the end game. The question is, would you believe it now? Because eternal life starts now. It doesn't start in heaven. It doesn't start of this second coming. We've been resurrected in Christ now. Will you believe it? Will you receive it? And will you walk it out? Will you believe it? Will you receive it? Will you walk it out? Is there a lie that's stuck in your head that tells you you have to be something more than what you are to actually qualify for everything he says is yours? Is there a lie right now in your head that tells you you have to be more of something other than what you are in order to qualify for everything he says is yours? That lie is from the pit of hell, and it's a weapon that the enemy is using against you to keep you from walking in the destiny and fullness of the righteousness and the life that Jesus so freely gives us. Let go of every sin and every lie that so easily ensnares and just receive the truth of his love over your life. Are you with me? Are y'all hearing what we're laying down here? This is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. From death to life. From death to life. Because he's loved us. Period. The end. World without end. This would be the time where I'd make a call. And I'm going to make one. If there's anybody in the sound of my voice that needs to confess something, this is a very particular call. I'm not going to ask you to confess it publicly. 
But if you need to confess something, you need to confess it in your heart and to God right now. And we're just going to spend a minute in prayer. And you're going to confess it in your heart and yield that thing to him so that you can receive the life that is so freely yours. Amen? So under the sound of my voice, follow with me. Let's pray. Father God, right now, for your children, as they hear and listen, Father, I pray that the gospel come alive. There are lies that the enemy would keep using in order to keep us from the truth of who we are in you. And right now, Father, Holy Spirit, speak to your sons and daughters. Right now, speak to each and every single one of them so that they might receive and believe the truth. So I want to give a space right now, Father, so that may, might be interaction with you. If there's something that you need to say, I encourage some of you to listen. I'm talking to you now. If there's something that he needs to say and you need to hear, I encourage for some of you to listen. And if there's some of you that need to actually say something, I encourage you to ask him to empower you what you need to say. Right now, in Jesus' name. So, Father, we receive your life through Jesus. We repent and renounce every lie. We repent and renounce every lie and receive your life through Jesus. And we thank you. We thank you for it because we've been loved so well. In Jesus' name, amen.